Hello, Think Liberty listeners. Welcome to episode 16 of Tales from the Shire. I am your host, AJ Olding. This week, I am once again sitting down with Nicholas Sarwark. This is the second part of the interview uh, that I put out um, two episodes ago. Uh, in that episode, we talked about um, the government's response to the COVID crisis and um, you know what it's been doing wrong and what it should be doing going forward. In the second half of the interview that I did with Nick, um, we talked more about um, what he's been able to accomplish uh, as chair and uh, what he's hoping for the party, um, you know, going forward um, now that he will no longer be chair, uh, uh, you know, well, who knows now that like conventions all up in the air on the day this comes out, uh, the LNC should have given us a ruling as to exactly what we're going to be doing as far as um uh, having our convention or not having our convention or having a rump convention or just having the LNC choose things. So who knows when Nick will actually not, no longer be chair, but it is his intention to not run again. Um, but anyway, uh, I digress. Please enjoy episode 16 of tales from the Shire, um, with Nicholas Sarwark. You recently announced that you are not running for reelection, um, for chair and, you did endorse somebody, correct? Yeah. Uh, so I was considering whether or not to run for a fourth term as chair. I've been chair. Uh, it'll be six years by the time we get to Austin. Uh, three terms consecutive. It's the first mm-hmm. time anyone's ever done three consecutive terms. It's a lot of work. Uh, I felt like I could. I still had work to do, and I was willing to do it. But there are opportunities that are available that are not available if I'm chairman of the party. There are certain restrictions that come with being chairman of the party. There are certain jobs I can't take. There are certain things I can't do for conflict of interest purposes or just you can't focus on on mm-hmm. too many things at one time. So I had a good conversation with Joe Bishop Henchman, who is also seeking the chair's position. And we talked through some of the things that I had concerns that he would do differently from me or places where I felt like I was stronger. Um and he talked about what his priorities were. And I got to a good place where I felt like he was in a position where he could take the work I had done, the direction and the culture I had built in the party. It wouldn't break. And potentially he could build on it in new directions that he's stronger in. You know, things like operations and growth and building systems and structures to make this more um, sustainable over time, right? Right. I had kind of done the vision thing for six years and got us in a direction where as a party we'd grown a lot, but he has built organizations. He used to be executive vice president of the tax foundation, built that organization up very well. Um, He's good at hiring people and and developing processes. He had built up alumni for Liberty, uh, the students for Liberty group when he ran it. And so the other thing is he made it very clear that he would, call on me to assist with things like communication and strategy, the things that I feel like I'm, I'm strong at. He agrees and isn't going to try and do it himself and not ask for advice or help. Right. And that's the biggest thing that I think a lot of libertarians make a mistake about both in their personal life and politically is we have this culture of self-reliance and independence. And sometimes that lets us not ask people for help or turn down help and say, no, I'll do it myself because I'm, you know, a rugged individualist. We're all in this together. And if you can get help from somebody, and this is basic Ricardo's comparative advantage, if somebody else is better at doing something, it's better they do the thing they're great at, you do the thing you're great at, and then you cooperate so that you get more out of the entire system. Well, I mean, division of labor is the whole thing we're going for in the market, right? Right. Um, Okay, so I guess I'm going to ask you a little bit about your time as chair. Can you tell me a little bit about like what your goals were going into being chair, what you think you accomplished, and then like how well do you think you aligned with what your goals were? Uh, so my goal when I sought the chair in 2014 was I saw a libertarian sort of cultural movement where libertarian was a more popular word. There was the Liberty movement. There was the success of people that sort of called themselves libertarian, but weren't quite libertarian, but the party itself was kind of flat. Mm -hmm. 
And so to me, it looked like we weren't taking advantage of a shift in the culture and a shift in American politics. And I didn't know why, but I had some ideas about how we could do it. After coming into chair, we got 50 state ballot access for the first time in, I think, 16 years in 2016. It's the first time we had had our candidate on the ballot in all 50 states going back to, I think, the year 2000 uh, because we got ballot access back in Oklahoma. And that was a risky move. I spent over 10% of the national budget that year just on that one project. But I knew that Oklahoma was the linchpin to get the whole thing done. And there's a big difference in the media's mind between 50 and 49, Mm -hmm. even though it doesn't make that big of a difference in electoral votes. Psychologically, if you can run the table, you play with the big boys. Well, going back to, I think one of the very first things I asked you at the beginning of this when, well, going back to your interview that you just did with Joe Scarborough, like he brought that up at the beginning of the interview. I don't know if you remember this, but one of the first things out of his mouth was, that you were the chair of one of only three parties that had ballot access in all 50 States last presidential election. And I, it's a big deal. It's worthwhile to, to have that just so that the media keeps saying it, I think. And then the combination of that with the quality of the 2016 ticket, like just the gravitas of having two experienced governors running against two people who had never run a government before. Or we like, had the I, most qualified ticket in the mm-hmm. entire country and we got triple the results uh, that we'd ever had in the entire history of the party. We got over three and a half percent of the vote. Uh, previous high water market had been 1%. The com- campaign raised over $12 million. The previous high water market had been like 2.7. Mm-hmm. So many more people voted libertarian in that election. And we had a huge spike in membership and we had a huge drop off in membership because a lot of people joined because they liked Johnson or they liked weld, but they weren't totally libertarian, right? They weren't Mm -hmm. really down for the cause, but what we've seen in the data now, the data analysis of the people who stayed, who came in during 2016, they're some of the most active donors to the party. So, Whenever we have a big national ticket that that draws that broad net and appeals to non-libertarians, it brings in a lot of people that are not totally down with us, but the ones who stay are very excited about the project because they came in during a period of success. And so it's success breeding success. We, we were just purchasing our national headquarters. We just signed the contract right before I became chair in 20. 20- 14 and we are less than $90,000 away from having it completely paid off. So we're going to, we are one of only three parties in the country that owns our national headquarters. And we're about to the point where we don't even have a mortgage on it anymore. I mean, we're, we've built up such a great culture and it's a culture of winning. It's a culture of recruiting candidates, a culture of supporting candidates, a culture of fundraising. You know, in the 2018 cycle, I was seeing candidates raising roughly an order of magnitude more money Mm -hmm. than they had in the past. So a level of race that would normally raise $5,000 was raising 50, a $50,000 race was raising 250 or $300,000. Look at Larry Sharp running for governor of New York. That was a $300,000 race. We'd never touched those numbers before because people saw that this was something different and new and attractive, and it had the momentum that it was worth investing in. Awesome. Okay. So uh, you mentioned a lot of the people who stay. How many of those people that stay from the people who come in for for the large name ticket um, do you think were converted to libertarianism while they were there and how many of them? Yeah, I guess that's a good question. So basically what happens is they come in, membership is usually paid on an annual basis. So Mm -hmm. they come in during an election. Some of them just are disappointed with the vote totals. They think we're going to get 10% or 20% or whatever. And then we don't. And they're like, "Ah, I don't want to be here anymore. Some of them come in and then they get all the emails and they get more into the platform and they see some of the press releases and they go, you know, I just don't agree with, as many things as I thought I did, right? Or I just didn't like the other options 
but this isn't really my home. But the ones who do stay, they, I've never seen anyone come into the party and get less libertarian. I, I agree with that a lot, actually. I think there's, and I include the gentleman who just suspended his campaign for the Republican nomination. Right. His, I was unaware that he suspended his campaign he suspended for the Republican today. nomination. Um, okay. But he, yeah, he, I talked to him about guns in 2016. And I talked to him about guns at Porkfest in 2019. A lot of people actually asked him questions about I, it. There's a YouTube, you know what? In the show notes, I'm going to post a YouTube video of me talking to him about guns at Porkfest. The answers he gave three years after he was in the party were way better than the answers he gave back well, then. So there's a certain former senator from Rhode Island who I feel is the exact same way now that he's come into the party. He's much better on issues that he wasn't great on. Those people don't come into the party and change libertarians. Libertarianism is, if you look at like rocks have a hardness scale, right? And they go from talc, which is super soft to diamond, which is super hard. And then everything in between ideas have a kind of hardness scale to them too. And there's something about the, the fundamental underpinnings of libertarianism. It's one of the harder ideas in the entire political philosophical world. So people come rub up against libertarianism and it's very seldom that you rub the edges off of libertarianism. It's a lot more often that libertarianism rubs some other stuff off of other people. Now the trick with that, because you have a hard ideology and this is more of a a strategy and tactic tactics thing is, you know, it's hard. So you don't have to push hard. You can just like let libertarianism be kind of brush up against people and introduce them to it slow because you, you have that confidence that your ideas are not going to, your ideas are not going to wane. If you just stay in contact with the other people, they're going to change over time. But if you push too hard, it's going to hurt and they're going to leave. And that's what I've seen happen to too many people who come in because they agree with us strongly on, say, one issue, like the drug war or guns or whatever it is. And then there's some libertarians that just poke and poke and poke and poke and poke right away. And it then they leave. Mm-hmm. But if you let them stay, they grow. Yeah, I, I agree with that quite a bit. Um, if you just sort of present ideas to people, actually... Um, Richard Manzo, I interviewed him, one of my first podcasts that I did for this show, or one of the first episodes that I did for this podcast, I interviewed Richard Manzo and we talked about uh, a time where he and I went out to, um, a town hall of sorts down in Nashua where people were talking about like the issues facing, uh, the local communities there today. And we, you know, kind of push the, the conversation towards zoning laws. And by the end of the, by the end of the discussion, we had a room of mostly left leaning people in an, in, in almost complete agreement with us. That's the zoning laws in the state are a major problem. And they're a huge part of what leads to the homelessness issue and, and, and the high rent costs in this state. And so like, I've seen it firsthand and, you know what? We'll also link to that in the show notes. AJ, remember that for later when you're listening back to this. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's if if you were able to get a room of people to become libertarian on that issue, that's enough for that day. Mm-hmm. Right? You don't have to shove a copy of the platform into their hand. You don't have to run the world's smallest political quiz on them. They agree with you that zoning laws cause more harm than they create good. And that they hurt the people that they care about. And that's good enough. They don't have to understand the philosophical reason why that's true. Because they can, they can work with you on fixing that problem. Mm-hmm. And what I've found over you know many, many years of doing this. Is if you work together with somebody on doing good. Doing something important to them. That that brings you closer. And they're willing to listen to you about other things because you have that shared bond of working together on important stuff. So there have been, um, you know, speaking real quickly on your, on what you're saying about not needing to put the platform in people's hands. There have actually been a couple of videos out there 
of people going to like the Tulsi Gabbard events and asking her if she's read our platform. What do you think of that as a strategy? It seems a little bit more pushy than what we were talking about, but it's not the whole strategy. It's not my strategy. You know, a lot of people ask, have you asked so-and-so famous politician to seek our nomination? And invariably the answer is no, Mm -hmm. because I don't ask people to seek our nomination. I make myself open to people to give them advice about how they could do it. I explain to them what we believe. I, I will talk to them about the issues that they have been pushing, whether or not those are a good fit, what the reaction is likely to be. I'm great with advice, but I think our party has grown up beyond begging people to seek our nomination. We are at a point now where I expect politicians to come to us and say, can I please have your nomination? Is it okay if I carry your standard into battle? We don't beg people anymore. We're a big boy party now. They come to us and they ask. And if the delegates say yes, they get to be the nominee. That's what happened with Gary Johnson. That's what happened with Bill Weld. And was it contentious? A little bit. But we didn't go begging them to run. Now, slight correction. There were individuals who went and asked Gary Johnson to run starting back in, I think, I think they started in 2009. And that's also good. There should be people who ask people to come and seek our nomination. Mm -hmm. I don't think party leadership has that role, or at least not the chair. I don't mind if other LNC members do it. I don't do it. But I'm happy to talk to people about policy. I've had a lot of good conversations with the congressman from Michigan, Justin Amash, Mm -hmm. about these are the Libertarian Party's priorities in the Congress. If you are able to help with these, I'd love to cooperate on it. I ask him questions about bills that are coming up and what his position is to get a sense of where he's at. Those are valuable conversations to have, but that's a dialogue amongst political equals. That's not begging, right? And I want to contrast that with uh, in 2008 or 2012, I think it was 08, the National Committee actually wrote a letter to Ron Paul basically begging him to come back and seek our nomination instead of the Republican one. And I opposed it at the time, and I think I would still oppose it. I think it's a Mm -hmm. bad look to ask. I think it's better for them to come ask us because we have the 50 state ballot access that's worth anywhere from 10 to $20 million, depending on how you calculate it. We have the political platform. We have a brand that is popular when no other party brand is popular. They should ask us nicely. And if they do, then we can be gracious and welcome them. Awesome. Okay. So we talk a lot about the positive things that have occurred with the party during your six years as chair, are there any actionable items that you think you've taken that have helped steer us towards that? Or have you just kind of been staying on top and keeping us all in line and whatever else, sir? I, I don't know anything that I can point to specifically other than the biggest thing I think I brought is I have a way of communicating the ideas that is a little different from everybody else. And it seems to resonate really well with people who are not with us yet. Mm hmm. I have a way of, of trying to tailor my language to communicate in words that people can hear. Um, and maybe it's from the trial work when I was a public defender. I don't know. But I've also tried to build a culture where it's a culture of welcoming. Right? It's a culture where we fight about ideas, but we don't fight about people. We don't have gatekeepers. And it's created some interesting scenarios where I've ended up being the person defending people coming into the party, even if sometimes those people are coming into the party because they don't like me. Right. Mm -hmm. I still don't have the role as party chair of being a gatekeeper. It's not up to me. Who's a libertarian. It's up to you. If you think you're a libertarian, if you feel that you're aligned with us enough to join, then we welcome you. If you're able to, to affirm the statement of, principles and the pledge, you're welcome to come and help do this work together. And 
I think that cultural shift is the biggest thing. And, you know, the other thing is trying to really focus on helping each other, right? Mm -hmm. Focus on building people up at the local level who are running for office, who are the activists, you know, building their state parties, try and give them the tools they need to do good work because it's not about the chair. You know, I can get a lot of interviews and I've gotten as many as I know how to, but that's just one guy. And maybe they see somebody on TV, but you're the one that they interact with at work. Mm -hmm. You're, you're the real, um, emissary of libertarianism. It's not me. I'm just the mouthpiece, if you will. So that culture is what I've tried to bring to the party. Awesome. I, I think you have actually brought that culture very well to the party and yeah, thanks a lot for that. I think you've done an incredible job with it. Um, any advice that you would give to whoever wins this at our convention, whether that be Joe Bishop Henchman or Josh Smith or someone else? You don't control libertarians. You show libertarians what's worth accomplishing and you bring them along with you. Um, Tim Mullen from Canada gave a speech Uh, He's the leader of their Libertarian Party. He gave a speech where he said, you know, people say it's difficult to herd cats and the Libertarians are like herding cats. He said, any farm boy knows how to herd cats. And he has this great slide where it shows a saucer of milk and all the cats come over to it. The way you herd cats is you don't herd them. You attract them. You persuade them. That's how you can lead Libertarians you show them the vision of what we can accomplish together and you let them find their own way to be helpful in that work. And being helpful in that work is different for different people. You know, in this upcoming presidential campaign, my hope is that everybody who's currently seeking the nomination finds a role where they can help the nominee be more successful. And maybe that role's on the campaign. Maybe it's as a member of the ticket. Maybe it's as an advisor or a finance committee chair. Maybe it's in a completely unrelated pack that goes and does unorthodox direct action to help the campaign along or to attack the other candidates in ways that the candidate wouldn't be able to do because that wouldn't be the appropriate role. But everyone's valuable. Everyone's valuable in this party if they want to help do the work. And we don't need to judge other people and say, you have to do the work the way I do it. Because we all have different talents. We all bring different things to the table. We need to respect and love each other because what we're trying to do to American politics and and literally the world to set it free is too important to get bogged down in, I want you to do it the way I do it. Yeah, so building on that just a little bit, um, I had a conversation with Adam Kokesh at the Massachusetts convention back in 2019. And I had noticed that he was like grabbing all the Kim Rufflet and a couple of her stickers and bumper stickers and, er, and, and button pins and stuff like that while she was still running for the nomination for president. And I asked him like, you know, if you're running against her, why do you want her stuff. I understand being nice to her. I understand being your friend and all that, but like the stickers and all that, why do you want all that? And he says to me, he's like, we're all on the same team. And at the end of the day, we've all got to help each other, you know, get to where we want to go, regardless of how our own internal elections go and our internal polls go and everything else. And so I thought, yeah, I made a ton of sense to me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I thought that built up, built a little bit off your last point. No, that that's one of Adam's greatest qualities. You know, everybody's got great qualities. But one of his greatest qualities is every time someone has gotten into the race, he has been very publicly welcoming to them, welcomes them to the race. He's welcomed um, Governor Chafee. He's welcomed Mark Whitney. He's welcomed all of these candidates to the race. He's always positive and nice 
I mean, he has sharp words on the debate stage because he wants the nomination and he thinks there's a different path that we ought to take as a party. But he does embody that, um, that kind of, you know, this is all just a, a playoff to see who gets to be the standard bearer. These are not enemies. The enemies are not in the room. And that's something that the late Lee Wrights used to say is the enemy is not in here. It's out there. And we never can forget that because if we forget that we waste all of our energy fighting over who's the most libertarian or are you a real libertarian? These are not useful conversations. They're not productive. They don't get us anywhere and they just make enemies. They don't make friends. Cool. All right. So I have one more, I have one last thing I wanted to ask you about before I let you go. And I know I'm a little over how long I told you this would take, but, um, you gave a, a notice speech for chair in 2012 and it kind of became, it's very well known at this point in time. And, and for those of you that haven't seen it, the gist of it was essentially, you know, we can't keep doing the exact same things and expect to bring in the, the philosophical base. You use different terms like the Ron Paul crowd and other things like that. Um, but can you walk us through a little bit of the story of that notice speech for chair in 2012 that you gave? Yeah. Um, so the short version is there were two candidates running for chair in 2012. There was Mark Rutherford, who was the vice chair at the time, and Mark Hinkle, who was the chair at the time. Right. So the previous chair, previous vice chair were both running for chair one for re-election, one to unseat him. And the, the 2010 to 2012 term was, the LNC was very factional. There were two camps. They fought each other all the time, a lot of bickering, not a lot of focus on the work, a lot of focus on who had advantage on the committee. And as an outside observer, I was not on the committee. I watched this stuff and thought, this is not helping no one's coming in because of these internal fights. These internal fights don't get us anywhere. And I like both of those gentlemen. Uh, I consider them both friends. But at the time, I didn't think that either of them were going to bring the party into a good direction because it was so contentious and nasty. You couldn't lead from there. Mm -hmm. So I had to fight for it because uh, the person gaveling the convention thought that it was not allowable for me to give a notice speech. So first I fought to get to give this speech. And then when I got up, I said, you know, these are the reasons why we shouldn't pick either of these guys. And we don't have to settle for one of these bad options in our party. When we have bad options, we can get better options mm -hmm. because if none of the above if no one is able to get a majority over none of the above, the seat is open and you have a new election, but neither of those candidates get to run. You have to be better than nothing to win election in our party. And I think one of the greatest things we could bring to the wider political world, the reason the speech is famous, it's the first time that note has ever won in party history. Mm -hmm. If you could bring that to the wider political world, a lot of our politicians that, that are currently in elected office aren't better than nothing. I and agree that, with that a lot. in itself makes every libertarian politician, every libertarian nominee is fundamentally better than a Republican or Democratic nominee. <laughs> right. How is it that we have to keep having this discussion about whether or not notice a lot of talk? Because for those of you that are listening and we're not in where was it in, in new Orleans in 2018, there was also a contention as to whether or not anyone was allowed to speak on behalf of Noda and Nick Sarwark actually had to go onto the chair and argue for someone to speak for Noda against him on the main stage. I, I think it's, um, some people think it, it's divisive and it can be, mm -hmm. if Noda's done wrong, it can be divisive. Other people think, um, shows a lack of unity you know, that you really shouldn't do it. It's kind of, you know, and there is a, a, a thought that you're not speaking for anything you're speaking against, which is something that, you know, I do caution people on is if you find yourself defining yourself by opposition, you're not really defining yourself. You're letting other people define you. 
I think it's like um, the Catholic Church always used to have when they would look at whether or not somebody would be granted sainthood. They had uh, the devil's advocate. So they would have one cardinal whose job was to argue against that person becoming a saint. And the reason you do that, and this is in organizational theory, you see this all the time. You want to have people in a room before you make important decisions that gives you the reasons why you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Because if you have too many people who are in too good of agreement, they're missing something. And you're not expecting where the thing you're missing is coming from. So you need to recognize the value in that. The thing about everyone having value, it's a theme that I've been coming back to over this last year. The person who is always critical has some value. Now, it may not be enough value to get very many votes and they may get booze or whatever, but you want to hear them. You want to hear them out. You want to let them do their critique because sometimes they're right. Not always. Very rarely, actually. The other thing is, I think if you're really going to be chair, you have to have the confidence to know that someone can get up and give a speech for Noda and you win anyway. Mm. Well, thank you for sitting down and talking to me. Um, is there any last thought that you'd like to leave my listeners with before we go? Or uh, They definitely should join the Libertarian Party and get involved. LP.org slash join. Go find a candidate you can support. Get engaged in politics. It's really helpful to have a different kind of voice out there in the community. And a lot of people don't even know that libertarianism is an option and you can help spread that message. All right. Thank you very much. All right. I hope you all enjoyed episode 16 of tales from the Shire. Again, I've been your host, AJ Olding. And my guest this week was uh, current chair of the libertarian party, Nicholas Sarwark. Um, if you enjoyed the episode, please share it with all your friends and family on all the different social medias. Uh, you can find us on all the different social medias. Uh, if you just search up think Liberty or think Liberty network, uh, if you really enjoyed the podcast, uh, you can show your support, uh, at, um, patreon.com. We, if you, if you just search up think Liberty, we, we will come up there. Um, or you can find, um, my show directly, uh, I have my own page on Facebook. That's just uh, Tales from the Shire. Um, all right. Thank you all so much. And I'll see you again for the next episode.